Welcome to Strategy Talk where the authors and editors discuss news and events with a splash of history. Our host today is Dan Masterson. Joining him is Jim Dunnigan, well-known military author and the Dean of Wargaming. Also, joining today's show is columnist and author retired Colonel Austin Bay. Welcome Austin and Jim. Jim, is the war stalled in Ukraine? Well, it's on a pause right now as both sides try to gather enough strength to make a difference. Uh, Putin, Vladimir Putin, the leader of the uh, Russians, says that he will never stop, that he will do, uh, he will fight on as long as it takes to absorb uh, Ukraine back into Mother Russia. Uh, <laughs> this, of course, makes other, the other former parts of the Soviet Union nervous because Putin has mentioned the uh, Central Asian uh, state uh, as the next candidate. He's even muttered about, you know, going after um, Poland and the Baltic states. The Baltic states were part of the uh, Soviet Union uh, for and then Russia. Uh, Poland, eh, not so much. So this has upset all of those countries that are now independent and do not want to be part of Russia again. Putin has not got the power to actually make any of this happen. Uh, so it's, it's threats. In fact, you can tell how desperate he is by the number of times he uh, says he's going to use nuclear weapons. I think it's up to 15 now. But he regularly does that when he has nothing else to say. The Ukrainians, of course, are continue to get equipment and support from the uh, NATO nations. Uh, the United States has held up its latest tranche of support, <laughs> but the Europeans are coming through. The Germans are being very helpful. Uh, and the Baltic states have been very useful, even though they, they're small. Their contribution is rather small. Uh, the Poles are are basically, uh, you know, putting together a rather large army. Uh, so if Putin tries to make good on his threat to go after Poland, uh, he'll have a fight on his hands. Russia is uh, the economy is in bad shape. Uh, the sanctions are really beginning to hurt. Uh, Putin says uh, Russia is now on a war, on a wartime, and in a wartime economy, uh, everything must be uh, shown, uh, must be used uh, for the war effort. This does not please a lot of Russians, who a lot of them lack basic amenity, you know, like indoor plumbing, uh, you know, uh, potable water supplies, and what have you. And there's a, a, a little increasing amount of, uh, how should I put it, rumbling inside Russia about why are we trying to uh, conquer uh, Ukraine, which is obviously not part of Russia. It's a foreign country, as more and more Russians are, are coming to uh, consider it. Um, uh, Putin is having a hard time uh, mobilizing more Russians to go fight. He started uh, basically recruiting foreigners. Uh, he's got about 1,500 uh, uh, people, not Gurkhas, uh, but uh, men from Nepal, whom he is, uh, I think he's got them under false pretenses, but he's issuing weapons and saying, hey, you know, we're going to go and, and maintain peace in Ukraine. I don't know how that's going to work out, but it doesn't look good. Uh, he's having less success in uh, recruiting uh, people in India and even in Cuba. The Cubans were not amused. Um, so Putin's situation is bad and it's getting worse. Uh, there are, you know, rumblings from uh, Moscow that uh, Putin may not be, you know, in power for much longer because all of his, he's seen as the mad czar, as it were, uh, Latin the mad, Vlad the mad, and uh, they basically uh, willing to bankrupt Russia in order to continue his war in, uh, in Ukraine. So, you know, take that for what it's worth, but it doesn't look good for the Russians because they're not making any progress. The Ukrainians, meanwhile, are piling up, like I say, more uh, Western aid. Uh, if the Americans let go of the $60 billion worth that they have basically sitting there, but there's a, there's a feud going on in Congress over whether or not it, it should be, you know, voted free, as it were, to go to Ukraine, um, it's going to take, you know, longer or, you know, it'll come sooner, depending on how much aid they get from the United States. Uh, like I say... The Germans and the Baltic states have uh, have seen that, and they basically increased their support. 
even France is, is uh, gathering more ammunition, more uh, more long range rockets and missiles and what have you. So the support is pouring into Ukraine. Uh, Russia is basically failing in uh, in obtaining enough support to uh, do anything, and uh, the war isn't over yet. Austin, your thoughts on this? Uh, well, I'm in print saying that uh, calling the current uh, tactical and operational situation uh, a stalemate. Nevertheless, I agree with Jim's analysis. Uh, the larger components, operational, strategic up, up are working against Russia. Uh, it doesn't seem that way in, uh, in the Western press. That's because all uh, at least especially U.S. Uh, domestic press, all they pay attention to is whatever is, is the propaganda line coming out of, uh, uh, out of Washington. Uh, the U.S. is still providing a number of, of essential uh, essential materiel and support to Ukraine. That includes intelligence support. Uh, a lot of that is, is cycled through NATO, but there are U.S. Uh, intel a- assets that uh, are ultimately uh, ultimately reach the information ultimately reaches Ukraine. Uh, Ukraine is in a situation where, it, where this is based on what I read, ammunition shortages. Now that is a problem, given what we have. That's a major problem, given what we've learned about uh, that the God of War artillery has returned to the battlefield, and uh, they've got to feed the guns. They, the thing is, there are enough sources. So 155 millimeter are uh, uh, in the in the Western world, free world, and uh, and, and in in Asia, non aligned. Let's say non aligned Asia, that uh, U- Ukraine can tap. the 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 problem is, and that Jim went into this uh, a couple of podcasts ago, is that Ukraine still has a lot of 152 millimeter uh, and other uh, Soviet Russian era. There are weapons, uh, and the uh, the stocks of those that were in former Warsaw Pact countries, a lot of them have either been shot up, shot away in the first two years, or the ammo is no good because, uh, goodness, the uh, Russia, the USSR dissolved in 1991, and the Warsaw Pact was already gone by the time the USSR uh, dissolved, and uh, that's how many years ago is that, uh, Dan? It's re- really it's 32 years. It was the end of '91, uh, 32. Uh, that that uh, the, the, those are hard. Uh, that's hard ammunition to difficult ammunition to find. It's is uh, is what it is. Uh, but let's say one other thing though about the strategic situation. Just again, this is 2024. Soviet Union goes away at the end of 1991. Everybody, 33 and younger, just say that. Of course, there've been some born before the in in 91 that would still be, uh, th- th- could still be uh, below, you know, 33 or so. But they were born after the Soviet Union fell apart. Unlike Putin, who was uh, as cold cold warrior as one one could find on the Russian side. These people have never known being part of a Russian empire. They've just known being threatened by a revived Russian empire. That applies to Estonia, Latvia, Lithuania. Uh, It applies definitely to to Ukraine. Now, Belarus, Kazakhstan, heavily influenced by uh, Moscow now, but... uh, Azerbaijan, Armenia, they're long lost. Armenia, though, has had its relationship with Russia, but that uh, also goes back to the Orthodox Orthodox days. Georgia's long gone. They've already fought a war between Russia uh, and and Georgia. And Putin doesn't realize that, that uh, you know, there, there are three decades of uh, a, a new generation that uh, doesn't have his vision. They don't long for Russian control. There are even Russians, ethnic Russians in these places, uh, like in eastern Ukraine and the like, that don't want to live under a crooked and corrupt government. 
which is, as Jim was saying, that's one of the issues that the Russians have to deal with internally. And uh, it's it's not that Putin is the only crooked character. He's not. The oligarchs are. But he is, what, Vlad the Mad is what uh, Jim called him. I think that's a, a very good moniker. I'll also end with this. It's it's minor point, but the Russians have hired some Nepalese. They're not Gurkhas, but they went to, went to Nepal hired several hundred, and now the Ukrainians have captured at least four. And the uh, Nepalese government is uh, now forbidden, this is what this is what I read recently, forbidden Nepalese from uh, uh, being enlisting as mercenaries to fight for Russia. They're, they're not Gurkhas. The article says that Gurkhas only want to work for Great Britain and India, but I, I thought that was uh, an interesting sidelight on how desperate Moscow is for soldiers. Jim, what about the Ukraine? Or about, uh, keep saying the Ukraine, and we shouldn't do that. <laughs> um, what about Ukrainian soldiers? Are I have heard that they are also having problems um, with manpower. Yeah, they've taken, they've taken far fewer losses uh, than the Russians. But in terms of a democratic country like Ukraine, they're very heavy losses. I think it's about 70 or 80,000 men. And they don't really want to fight, you know, a, a meat grinder kind of war, which Russia has been doing. Uh, Aktiva, that a town they recently occupied, well, most of it, uh, they literally just threw thousands and thousands of soldiers into it, and they took enormous losses. Uh, that is making it more difficult for uh, Russians to find troops because... Over a million Russian military-aged men have left the country. Uh, even though Russia outlawed that sort of thing, they couldn't stop. I mean, the, uh, especially in, in Finland, where uh, there's a, a border with Russia between uh, Norway and, and well, Finland, Norway, and, and, uh, and, and Russia. Uh, uh, people are basically crossing that border and asking for asylum. And the... Uh, yeah, the Norwegians and the Finns aren't refusing anybody. They just take them into custody and said, "All right, we'll we'll feed you and take care of you until you can go until it's safe to go back." Um, I don't know what Putin will do. I doubt he will use nuclear weapons. That's a that's a mutually assured destruction sort of situation. Well, actually, it's, it's not mutually assured. The Russians all get blown away, uh, but you know the West can. As they, as that general and and Doctor Strange said, you know, we'll take a haircut, but we'll still be here. Um, uh, Putin is basically playing a psychological war. Uh, he does not want to be known to history as the man who uh, again used nuclear weapons. Um, but it's it's losing its shock effect. The more he uses it, uh, the less impact it has. Um, Putin's running out of options, and he realizes that if he fails in Ukraine. He's probably going to be out of power. I mean, his uh, his hold on the, uh, the as the head of the Russian government is getting shakier as the uh, as the situation in Ukraine remains stalemated. And as I pointed out, uh, the Ukrainians are, are are getting ready to take territory back. Uh, for example, in terms of territory, they basically destroyed the Baltic Sea fleet. Uh, we've covered that in strategy page. They did it in a very clever fashion using, uh, you know, uh, USC's unmanned uh, uh, surface vehicles uh, uh, to basically destroy uh, most of the uh, the uh, Black Sea Fleet ships. And the ones that remain have fled to uh, bases uh, in the far northeast, as far away from uh, Ukraine as they can get, uh, because... The uh, Ukrainians have, have told them if, if you come back into our territory, especially if you try and threaten the, the grain trade, which is still a mainstay of the, uh, the Ukrainian economy, if you try and interfere with that again, uh, we'll come back at you. So, you know, no matter where uh, Putin turns, he's playing a losing hand. And yeah, like I say, the people in, the, in Moscow and the government are saying, well, why should we all pay for this? Why should we all suffer because Vlad the Mad, you know, was determined to uh, destroy Russia in his effort to uh, destroy not just Ukraine, but all the Western allies. I mean, there's been some talk of sending technical, uh, uh, European troops as technical advisors 
into Ukraine. And that caused connection, uh, both in Europe, United States, and Russia. Uh, but they may already be doing that. You know, just don't mention it. If you have to send people in to show the Ukrainians how to use equipment or whatever, or simply to coordinate, you know, supplies coming in, uh, nobody's going to know. You don't say anything. So some somebody, you know, basically uh, messed up and said, oh, yeah, we have some people there. Uh, you keep your mouth shut, you know. <laughs> Think before you talk. Um, so that may blow over. Uh, there are no fighting combat troops in Ukraine from the West, but there are, how shall I say, helpers, you know, uh, facilitators. Uh, some of these people have a diplomatic immunity. I mean, you can just basically add a few more military attaches to the Ukrainian embassy and say, okay, guys, go out there and do your thing. They can't. They can arrest you. You know, if you get caught, you know, we can get you out because you diplomatic immunity. The worst thing they can do is send you home. Um, so, you know, Putin's like I say, he's running out of cards to to play, and uh, he's going to keep grasping for us. He says, you know, he's basically willing to fight until the last Russian, and that's that. That did not go over well in Russia, uh, as uh, you know, as, as I mentioned. You know, they, they're trying to hire uh, you know, the uh, Nepalese. And other foreigners, that's not working out at all. The Russians don't want to go. Uh, and, uh, you know, maybe Putin will do himself, everybody a favor by just going in by himself, you know, the last man. And when he's no longer standing, it's all over. So, you know, things are looking good. It's not a stalemate, but it's moving slowly in Ukraine's direction. Uh, there have been, like, there have been, you know, setbacks, mainly in terms of, like, the American Congress which is holding up that $60 billion, you know, shipment of additional weapons. But like I say, the Europeans have taken up a lot of this slack, even France, of all people, uh, because they realize that as long as this goes on, uh, it disrupts trade with uh, with Russia. Russia was doing a very uh, lucrative trade for both sides with Europe before this all started. Uh, a lot of the, some Euro- European countries were depending upon uh, Russian gas, you know, to meet their, their fuel needs, that has been uh, disrupted. So I say, you know, Putin is running out of the, you know, uh, excuses for why the heck he's doing this. And more and more, you know, Russians and, and, and Europeans uh, are saying, look, you know, we had a good thing going, let's get it back. Uh, leave Ukraine alone. Um, and, uh, you know, and we'll just go on. Of course, Putin wants to make, he's willing to make peace if he's allowed to keep portions of Ukraine he already has. The Ukrainians, of course, are saying no. Well, more of them are saying, well, um, you know, uh, but if, if they if they leave Russia in possession of Crimea, parts of the, uh, you know, the two provinces in eastern Ukraine, you'll have a, a, uh, a long-term grievance. And those things often, you know, boil over and turn into a while. That's how World War One got started. Uh, and uh, you don't want that sort of thing hanging over your head. Uh, so I don't know if anybody can convince Putin to make a clean street. Just get out of Crimea, get out of e- eastern Ukraine, and then go back to uh, the good old days where everybody was trading with everybody and times were good. But that's not what Putin wants at the moment. And uh, he has to change his mind before we can be over with it all. Let's uh, switch gears and talk about the Red Sea. Austin, that's becoming a real problem uh, that it doesn't seem like the U.S. and the West is handling well. My understanding is uh, the U.S. press isn't talking about it much, but Egypt is really suffering because of what's happened there in the Red Sea that uh, they've lost a huge amount of revenue. Dan, the whole world's suffering. And this this has been going on, the problem in the Red Sea, presented by uh, the Houthis, which are just a proxy army for the Iranian Ayatollah regime. That's That's been a problem really since, I'll say, 2013, 2014. You even had some... Uh, unmanned uh, attacks, robot boats is what they call them, a couple of cases where uh, the Houthis would have uh, a boat loaded uh, with high explosives, try to uh, hit a a tanker, try to hit a commercial ship. 
or uh, even go after uh, some of the uh, n naval naval forces that were in engaged in trying to quote unquote uh, help uh, stop the Iranian arms shipments uh, to, to the Houthis. Now those weren't as disruptive as they have become within really the last uh, two years. And when I say they weren't as disruptive because m marine insurance, maritime insurance rates were not spiking and climbing because the attacks were so infrequent. Nevertheless, the strategic message that the Iranians were sending is we can cut off Red Sea maritime activity, commercial act uh, activity, just like we can through the Straits of Hormuz, which connect the Indian Ocean, the Arabian Sea, to uh, the Persian Gulf. And, of course, flowing through both, uh, you know, the, it's the Bab al-Mandab is the, the strait that connects the uh, Indian Ocean, Arabian Sea, to the to the Red Sea. Yeah, huge amounts of, of traffic, including uh, oil tankers, but also, uh, look, India, shipping to uh, to uh, Europe uh, through the Suez Canal, Egypt, as you say, losing lots of money on transit fees, but going to uh, through the Mediterranean uh, to Europe, European goods going to India or all the way around India back to the Straits of Malacca, Singapore, to East Asia, in other words, Japan and uh, China, uh, South Korea, uh, huge amounts of international trade. And one of the larger components of a shipment, a single ship, large, larger considerations in the cost of, a, of, a, uh, of shipping is the insurance on a particular cargo. And so, some of the things the actuarialists have, you know, what's the cargo, what's the crew like, what's the record of the shipping company, what kind of shape is the ship in, in other words, standard issues that you have with uh, determining uh, a, a cost of insuring a particular trip and a particular cargo, but there's also war, and war affects the, as what the Houthis are doing on the Iranians' behalf, uh, increases, dramatically increases the cost of uh, the insurance, and uh, that hits everybody's pocketbook. It what it does is add just you know, just look at the geography. It increases depending on the type of cargo and the, and the ty uh, type of ship. The transit time from let's say Mumbai uh, to uh, I'll, I'll pick out a port Marseille. All right, in the, in the Mediterranean, the uh, transit time is increased by anywhere from uh, six to 14 days having to go around the Cape of Good Hope. There are some ways that uh, to uh, speed it up. It's really the basic minimum uh, it increases, nine, nine to 14 days or, or more. Again, it depends on the speed of the particular uh, merchant ship. It's so easy, it's much easier to go through the Suez Canal. But if you go through the Suez Canal, you run the risk of, I mean, if you go into the Red Sea of being uh, hit by a Houthi drone or a ballistic missile or uh, and sunk uh, or, or even being uh, hi hijacked. And the insurers prefer safety, and so do the shippers. And so right there, there's an added cost both in paying the crew uh, delay uh, the, on the, the supply chain uh, uh, and the like, and that affects more than just Egypt. It affects uh, everybody in Europe. It affects you know, every it affects everybody in North America, same uh, uh, the same way. And so, in other words, it's a it's a form of extortion uh, run by the Iranian regime using its uh, uh, Houthi proxies. What do we do about? We sketched this, I think, uh, two or three podcasts ago. I, I said that there are ways to absolutely suppress, you're not going to destroy it all, but suppress these Houthi launch sites if the United States chose to do it. Uh, and their, their weapon systems, uh, most of them deliverable by 
Air Force uh, heavy bombers that uh, would dramatically suppress the Houthis' ability to fire their uh, missiles uh, against ships and uh, of naval ships because they've attacked uh, U.S., French, and British ships as well, naval ships as well as the, the commercial ships. Now, <clears throat> be expensive, but it would also greatly, uh, it would greatly suppress, again, I'm not going to say destroy, the Houthis' ability to carry on this extortion racket. That has been done, by the way, before we go any more into it. I know, but we and really hadn't happened. hit them hard. We have done it. Have, hard. We have. There have been, there have been cruise missiles, uh, apparently launched from submarines as well as uh, yeah. surface ships. The, uh, there's a, a, a growing coalition of warships uh, from foreign countries, including India, of all places, because they're suffering from this. And they have hammered in the last week or so uh, the Houthis so hard that they're not getting any return fire anymore. Now, the Houthis are still issuing press releases, but that's not the same as firing an anti-ship missile or doing anything at all. Aerial reconnaissance, uh, again, the Defense Intelligence Agency can, you know, supply that, <laughs> and, you know, uh, behind the uh, uh, scene, uh, are showing that the Houthis don't have much anymore uh, because they've been hit, in, again, in the last week or so with hundreds of missiles and bombs and what have you. And again, these were fairly accurate because they had the, the benefit of satellite and aerial uh, reconnaissance photos. Uh, they knew where the targets were, and they hid them. So, you know, I'll, unless the, the Houthis, you know, uh, perform a magic trick, which they are unlikely to do, that's on Islamic sorcery that'll get you killed, uh, they have nothing. In fact, the, the number, the, the ships moving, you know, uh, past the El Bab, the, you know, the, the Straits. Otherwise, the, the Straits were never controlled by the Houthis. The interference came through the north. They were basically operating out of Hodita and uh, various other, you know, uh, coastal areas. Hodita is the major port, the major port for uh, Yemen, uh, and they can no longer do that uh, because their 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 weapon systems have been targeted and uh, destroyed. And if any more of them pop up. The uh, aerial and, and satellite surveillance are still there. They're hit again. So, as of, I think, yeah, this week, actually last week, uh, the number of shipments, uh, you know, uh, uh, going through the Red Sea has started to increase. Um, and, of course, the Egyptians will feel that because they've lost a lot of money. They, they make about $10 billion a year on transit fees through the Suez Canal. So, they're... They're very encouraged by this. But the basic thing is, the countries involved have become fed up. They said, look, either we do nothing and suffer big time, or we do all we can do and try to have some impact. They did all they could do, and apparently they can do more. I mean, there are a lot more cruise missiles that, that, than they've had. That's what I saw. Exactly. Right. And, and, and a major number of them were fired. So I think, you know, the, the Houthis are on the, on the losing side here. And uh, if they keep shooting... Uh, we'll keep shooting back with more, and they can't handle that. They don't have a supply line of, of weapons. They have what they had, and they're running out. Every time they fire a missile, they don't get a replacement. We fire a missile, we send in another of uh, our four Ohio-class SSGMs, you know, uh, nuclear-powered, uh, guided missile uh, submarines, and uh, those things carry about 150 cruise missiles. Um, and uh, apparently some of those have been put into use. So we have an infinite supply of, uh, compared to the Houthis, of ammunition, and we're using it. They're feeling it. I think, uh, you know, we're going to be hearing from them about, hey, can we make a deal here uh, before we get wiped out? Because that's what happens to them. you got to remember, there's a civil war going on in Yemen. That's where the Houthis got started in, in the far north. They moved south, and, of course, the further south they moved, the weaker they became. There is still fighting going on between the many government forces and Houthi forces in, in central Yemen. Uh, and they're losing that because they have no more supplies. The Iranians can't reach them. In fact, the Iranians are washing their hands and saying, hey, we have nothing to do with this because Iran is hearing talk from NATO states, from the United States, well, let's attack Iran directly, the source of supply. Why let them hide behind their, their proxies and their cutouts, you know, their, 
they're 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 the guys who are basically doing the fighting and dying, you know, for the Iranians. So the Iranians are backing off. I think if the pressure continues, uh, it's going to be all over, and uh, the Houthis will be the loser, and the uh, yeah, the uh, maritime traffic in the uh, in the Red Sea will be the winner. All right. The one the one thing that I, I, I have been concerned about is their uh, missile stockpiles, and the claim is is that they've uh, had you know, several thousand missiles uh, and uh, and loggers off the coast, back in the, uh, in northwestern I- I- in Yemen, and also buried. In other words, uh, uh, in bunkers or the like. That's what I want to go after them with uh, with two thousand pound JDAM. Those were the things I want to hit. Then they don't have anything. And well, that's but that's what the that's what the the coalition is willing to do now. They're sending well, aircraft. Do now, do aircraft. now. Yeah, we should have been should have been doing it eight months ago. I that's know, it. I know, but it's better late than never. And now they feel like that. I wrote about this, Jim, and you and I actually talked about this in another right. podcast about knocking knocking them down. And all right, so we've started doing it really within the last eight to ten days. Right. All right, all right, exactly. But it's, it's been sustained. And- and it's, it's working, been... and they re- and they realize right. that, like I say, the the Houthis can't get more supplies. We got plenty that we can use. Indeed, we got a lot of old missiles uh, and, and have to, that are going to age out if they don't use them pretty quick. I'm excited to see the Indian Navy move in, and it, I read about that too. I guess over the over the weekend that India was going to do it because India's lost a lot of money, Dan, because of they lost a lot of money. It's cost them money. Both in, in uh, insurance, shipping fees, uh, transit time, and the like, because the Suez Canal is blocked. They they're uh, they're angry and they're uh, capable of uh, providing a lot of firepower if they uh, if they want to. Now, and, and, they, and they probably and they probably realize that well, we have to get involved because for a long time the Indians were saying, well, let somebody else take care of it. But they now have at least ten warships um, uh, in the area. And they find out that, hey, when India gets involved, things happen. Well, that may not be entirely true, but if they believe it, it's partially true, and it works. Uh, so once you've got the entire world, so to speak, uh, against you, and that's what the that's what the Houthis have done, because basically they're, they're, they're as Wilson pointed out, they're choking one of the most vital trade routes in the world, uh, you know, in the, in the Red Sea. Um, uh, you can't win. So if we hear about the Houthis saying, well, hey, let's make some kind of peace deal, uh, maybe we could talk. But the thing is, don't let them have access to Iranian supplies again. Absolutely. Iran, Iran is more than happy to resume their shipment. Now, for a long time, we had a blockade off the coast of uh, Vietnam, and the U.S. Navy was regularly uh, you know, inspecting you know, all kinds of small ships, small that they found out that the Iranians were moving in smaller shipments via fishing boats, and we grabbed a lot of those. You know, we basically take the crews uh, off the boats, we destroy the weapons, while well, we, yeah, we basically just blow up the weapons, let the ships sink, and deposit these guys on shore somewhere and said, you know, you want to go through this again? You know where you know who to call. You know, and so I, I think the Iranians got a lot fewer phone calls after that. Um, but that's what you got to do. Half steps do not work. You know, try to say, well, let's, let's, let's reach a truce to my A truce means the more aggressive side is going to keep at it. And that's the Iranians. And that's why we've got the Iranians worried now because there's talk of attacking Iran directly. And that's the last thing the Iranians want. Now, how long this will last, it's hard to say because the Iranians will get right back at their little game uh, as soon as they feel it's safe to. So the question is, can you maintain this uh, situation where Iran does not feel safe, you know, indefinitely? That would be a good idea. Well, I hope Iran takes this as the lesson it uh, it is to the uh, that your your proxies will lose. But then, Dan, if you'll recall, two or three podcasts ago, I was advising go to the source, which is the Iranian Ayatollah regime. They need- well, they have, they have trouble inside Iran. That's another uh, consideration. The Iranians have an internal rebellion blo- uh, grow- growing because the, the Iranian people have been doing very poorly. 
uh, you know, the, the economy is a mess, and they they understand why it's happening. Uh, the government, uh, the religious dictatorship, is pouring all this money into you know their their wars abroad, Syria, you know where the uh, Yemen, wherever, and it's the Iranian people who are suffering. You know the the the, the Ayatollahs, the religious leaders, they're not suffering. They feel it, it, it's God's will, and they're just doing what God wants them to do. But the Iranian people don't want any part of it. Uh, so, you know, uh, people will go along with all kinds of compromises as long as they can. But when it starts to cost them, which happened in Iran, the Iranians are saying no. And if they say no now, uh, loud enough, and they have to be careful because the the, uh, the religious dictatorship in, uh, in Iran has ordered the uh, IRGC, the uh, Iranian Republican Guard, to kill uh, Iranians who, who uh, basically uh, oppose it. And there's been about a thousand Iranians killed. And that basically had the population backing off. And now they're saying, look, if we don't either replace the government or basically, you know, uh, scare enough to stop getting the gar- our Iran and its people in trouble, it's going to keep happening. So, you know, there's a problem. Uh, it's always been a problem in Iran. The last time they had a revolution, it got pretty bloody. And so people don't want to have a war where a lot of them, they are going to get killed. But now they realize that, you know, it's been, what, decades? And uh, and we're still, you know, living hands and mouth. You know, so either we do something or it'll go on indefinitely. Well, we'll wrap things up there. Uh been a pleasure this morning and we'll talk to you gentlemen next time. Until then. Bye bye. All right. Bye guys. Bye.